From the Bill of Rights Institute, Fabric of History weaves together U.S. history, founding principles, and what all of this means to us today. Join us as we pull back the curtains of the past to see what's inside. In a world of Zoom, Netflix, and automation, technology is all around us. This week, Mary, Gary, and Aaron take a look at the most significant technological changes across history, from the wheel to the dot-com era, to understand human reaction to change. Does technological change always equal progress, or does it present new challenges? What happens to those who don't want to adapt? I think that 2020 will go down in the books as the year of the pivot, capital P. Thanks to this COVID moment, technology is front and center in our minds. I know here at BRI, like most of you, we've had to make adjustments in terms of how we use and respond to technology. And this made me think of a sign that I used to have hanging at the front of my history classroom, which read, if you don't change with the times, are you left in the dust? And this is, it's a rhetorical question meant to guide hundreds and thousands, in some cases, years of teaching history of the United States and the world. But I think it's also a really great question for us to talk about now, just because of because of the situation that we are all in together, is technological change inevitable? And there's this chicken egg element of it as well. Does technology drive change or does change drive technology? And then the eternal question of how do we respond to change? I think these are, these are questions you could ask in a classroom, but these are questions I think you could ask yourself anytime, really, if you wanted to be that sort of person, but especially now in this COVID moment. So Gary, Aaron, what do you, I mean, what do you think about this moment that we're in and how it's pushing technology right into our face? I am tickled by your big questions. Um, the idea that you had these questions on your wall means that these are ongoing questions, right? You're not just throwing them up there when there is some kind of change. Is technology something that is just always driving and and uh, always moving uh, in some kind of forward direction? Um, you can partake in it, but it's it's going to be happening anyway. And even in our lo own lifetimes, we've seen technology change so much over time that it makes you think, well, it must always be moving. But that is a good question. I don't know. Uh, uh, and I want to ask Aaron the same thing. Like, is it always moving? Is it always inevitable? Does it does it always develop or does it take kind of starts and stops or? I mean, I think this year has definitely made me realize that technology may be inevitable. Um, I think especially right now, though, <laughs> in full disclosure, the way that we are recording this podcast is remotely. We are using Zoom. We're using our own microphones. I love it. I know. Big spoiler. I actually heard from a listener who didn't realize that the three of us are in three completely different locations when we record this. And I think that comes from what you were just saying, Aaron, in terms of there's a need, right? This idea of technology meeting needs. I think of the phrase, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? That, 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 there's a need for us in this case to communicate. There's a need for classes to happen. There's a need for learning to happen. But how that happens, technology can either serve that purpose or possibly get in the way. In meeting those needs, there are often perhaps unexpected consequences that can be negative, sometimes positive. But I think that's a really good part, right? So you've got this idea that that you were just saying that you know, the, the technology to communicate has existed, but now it's perhaps been enhanced. Maybe we're doing it slightly differently, but we're still doing it because it's meeting a need that we have. Maybe it's about reaching a greater number of people. Maybe it's about quality. But then what is what is gained and what is lost from that, I think, is is a really, really good question to ask. And I think also sometimes you know, we're talking about um, inevitability when it meets a need, but also kind of I'm I'm thinking back like, oh, well, you know, Zoom was being used before this. We had these technologies that were available to us before the need was as great as it was. Yeah, so it's, it's very interesting. We have lots of fun to unpack. 
looking at the way technology is now is sometimes difficult only because it's it's surrounding us now we don't know what the long term impacts are going to be so you know as as big history fans as you're talking about a technology meeting a need um and then those impacts i, I like to think about going about going further w- could can you in, all indulge me because one of the things that i taught about that i was fascinated by in in um, technology and teaching was was like the textiles of like the industrial revolution like the machines for that because i think that is like what you're talking about right we like clothing right it does get chilly <laughs> clothing's really cool. cool i think right we all agree generally clothing popular among human beings right we were making clothing it's not like we just invented clothing out of the out, out of the blue and yet there was a need maybe for more or or just less expensive clothing whatever and so machines from the textile era you know start 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 evolving saying like all right if if by hand we can make you know, thread a certain thickness or do it so frequently? What about if we can get a machine to do it? And really brilliant designs from these machines early on, um, you know, spinning jenny and cotton gin and all the the classic inventions from there. And it did, I think, meet a need, right? You had more clothing, you had the thing you were uh, were going for. But then (laughs) that wasn't the end of the story. Um, When you talk about need, you know, I think things almost change. I don't know if you'd agree with that, that that can technology create things we didn't know we needed, like denim, like jeans. Like I did did we need jeans (laughs) or have we just come to need jeans? I think that that makes sense. sense? I think I mean, well, first of all, I think defining what is a need and what is a want. I think that's a whole conversation. In and of itself. And I oh. think defining um, a technology is, is I mean, I think today when we say technology, at least I think of a computer or a phone or something like that. But I think at its most basic, and again, world history teacher coming at you here, technology is a tool. So whether that tool is language, whether that tool is writing, it helps you do something easier or, you know, like you said, it fulfills the needs to keep records um, to communicate more effectively with people. And you just fast forward. So I, I went way back. <laughs> I went back thousands of years. So I'm going to come back <laughs> right. to uh, to the textile um, revolution. And I think that, I mean, human beings, we're problem solvers. We have these large brains and we like to create things. And that capacity, that rate of change at which we are making new things or adapting to things is just accelerating faster and faster. And I think it starts to pick up in that early industrial revolution, which starts in the textile industry. Oh my gosh, I feel I'm having such a a moment of stand. This was one of my favorite (laughs) things to teach in world history was the industrial revolution and all those um, inventions. We always made up these ridiculous rhymes like Hargreaves weaves to remember James Hargreaves, basically spinning Jenny, all these machines. But it's not that, it's not that we, you need denim. We survived for thousands of years without it. But it's just that it's things are changing so fast because humans have this really endless capacity to make things and create things. And like you said, that's going to lead to problems. Like what if you were someone who used to work at home and make cloth and now you're out of a job because the, the machine can do it faster and more efficiently. So there's always a mixed bag. But um I don't. I think that need and want thing. And again, if we're talking about this acceleration of change, perhaps we are accelerating our wants and needs. Like I don't. I don't need a new phone, but a lot of people think they do. I think they really all drive each other. You know, someone decides, well, I can do this. I can find a way to do this faster. I can find a way to do this that will therefore yield a greater profit. And, you know, that increases the supply of things. And it kind of then we have greater access to something. And then the greater access we have to it, the more we use it, the more we like it, the more we want it. And it just really, it almost seems cyclical to me and kind of drives that the whole that whole idea of technology forward, right? If that's always the cycle we're in, we're always going to be finding a way to do something smarter, better, faster cheaper. So that's sounding a lot like to me that Mary's first question about inevitability is one that we're saying that there's just something in us that wants to say, hmm, what if I tried this? Or there is a need. How can I uh, how can I address that? Or or even, you know, let me just see if this is possible. And maybe when something's created, you don't 
know necessarily what's going to happen. You know, we can certainly get into the effects of the cotton gin on slavery in the United States, um, but also what happens with the accessibility to be able to have the clothing and leading to factories and whole new systems of doing things. But it definitely strikes me like we're saying, yeah, there definitely seems to be a drive forward. Um, But then I love this other question about the what causes what, like, right, is the drive forward happening because of the creation or is the creation happening because of the needs and the drive forward and the way things are going? And I think that is something to contemplate at a break. Have you checked out our free digital textbook, Life, Liberty and the Pursuit of Happiness? This fully adaptive resource lets you dive into U.S. history with compelling stories and diverse voices from nearly 100 scholars. And because it's entirely online, you can access features like text-to-speech, online note-taking, and more. Sign up at mybri.org. And we are back. We were talking about there's so many different elements of technology. And we define that as inventions, but also skills. Mary mentioned language, techniques, ways of doing things. And and we acknowledge that they often come from some sort of clear need. But sometimes it's not always clear. You know, that chicken and egg approach of the did the new technology drive some kind of new actions, new ways of being? Or is the need for new ways of being solely being met by some new technology that's being created. I, I don't know that I don't know that the answer is one or the other, but I think that's a, a reasonable question to ask. What drives what? Does technology drive change or does change drive technology? Oh man. I mean Gary's questions always <laughs> I feel like if Gary were my teacher, I would be sitting there like, don't call on me, don't call on me, don't call on me. Philosophy <laughs> <Right. laughs> classes, man, they are the I best. Know, I mean, I, I that's such a hard question. I'm trying to think of and I I think that, well, if you're talking about very, in very early, the dawn of human history, and we're, if we're talking about simple, invent simple, like it's not, it's a huge deal, but inventions that we would now call simple, like the wheel. Um, I think those are scientists call them machines. simple inventions. Like- yeah. But I feel like that's yeah. Pulleys. But that's block a little and unfair because, I mean, it's not just, you don't just <laughs> sit around and like, let's have the wheel. Like, it didn't happen that way, I'm sure. But. I still don't know how to create a pulley system. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> I, th- I think it's more about that they become part of bigger things. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I meant my before I went to that, I, what, I was, what I was trying to say is I think that the need drives technology, which creates change. But I also think, and I, I said before that there's this, it's this human capacity. I mean, that's what separates us from all these other creatures is our, our brains and our ability to problem solve. But I also think what separates us is our adaptability. And that also is related to the brain. Like no other animal has thrived anywhere you put it, anywhere in the world. And why is that? Because we can adapt. So I think when you have a technology that creates a change. I, I guess it's it's sort of both things. I feel like I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting. Uh, I need a specific example, but um, can we think of a time where technology itself made changes happen? Okay, I would give. I would say the railroads. I think you could consider the railroads the internet of their time, right? So af- after the Civil War, you have this boom in railroad construction in the United States, and it literally binds the country together with iron and steel. Side note, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, who we featured on an earlier but shout out hey. to Cornelius the Commodore, <laughs> he switched over to steel on his New York line, and then other people followed suit. And of course, steel is stronger than iron. But, but there's this literal web backbone of steel uniting the country together. So that drives movement. You have more people coming to work on the railroads. You have people moving across the country. So that's going to open up questions with settlement of the West and relationships with Native Americans. And then it's easier to move stuff. It's easier to move goods. It's easier to move, you know, the cattle to feed people out in the West. It's easier to move clothes or, you know, consumer goods out to people that are settling from the east out to people settling out west. So it's, I think that's a really good example of the complicated chicken egg technology. 
is, and, and time, time itself, because you have you needed all of the railroads to be on the same schedule. So you have this creation of standard time. We're all going to follow by the trains. So I think that it really it bound people together literally and also figuratively. And then it had all of these offshoot changes that people had to adapt to. So now you have people that can, you know, you can communicate or be in touch with people all the way across this this massive country. And I'm always, I am always struck by <laughs> just how big the country is. Like when you fly across the country, it's enormous. It's And it's so huge and varied. And I think we sometimes lose sight of that. And I, I taught in the suburbs of DC and a lot of kids had never done that. It's such a huge, it's so vast. And there's so many people and to, to, to be connected like that. It almost is like an internet, the OG internet, if you will. No, that's great. I think, you know, following what we were saying earlier, the people did travel, right? People did move cattle, but I mean, not like that, right? Then, <laughs> I mean, it, if I learned anything from Back to the Future 3, nothing goes as fast as the train uh, <laughs> in the 1800s. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but carrying things, I think that's a that's an amazing example because, again, it's hard to – it. I don't know. It would have been possible to know what kind of effects that would have. I mean, inventing the me new measurements of time is is an incredible concept. Yeah. But I think the other thing that I think that is interesting about the trains and the railroad is that they're still around and they're still like freight rail mm -hmm. is still a huge part of our economy. We just don't think about it. A lot of people don't realize how many goods and things are moved by train to this day. Um so a lot of people think, oh, who rides the train? Like, where do you see a train anymore? Answers but, everywhere. But they're still there. And I think that's, <laughs> yeah, it, there is. So I think that's also kind of analogous, again, speaking from um, where I sit in my life where the internet is, I've always had the internet, is I just don't think about it. It's always there. So it's not, it doesn't seem like a big deal anymore. So I think that the analogy kind of extends there as well. So that would be my answer. So I like this. Uh, I, th I like this analogy between the trains and the internet itself, because again, we you're right. We do sort of take for granted this this internet. I and mean, again, we're able to do this because of it, and get it out there to people because of it. the the train The train answer seemed to be that this invention caused major change. Um, is the internet the same? Was it the creation of the internet something that caused change, or was it the result? of changes that were happening. What's the deal with the internet? <laughs> That's my, <laughs> what is this old internet thing? Uh, what are your experiences with, with, with the internet and the early, your early use of it and what it became? Did you foresee that? Could you see all that coming? I know I certainly couldn't. I mean, I remember we had um, AOL <laughs> and I got my first screen name <laughs> when I was in middle school. And then we would just use it to instant message or chat with people. And then I guess it became, um, I guess then we started to have the high school librarian presentation on how to use ABC Clio and other online um, databases for research, but we were still expected. We had to have mostly books. So I don't, I, there's no way I could have foreseen. I should also say, I mean, I, I work at a place called the Bill of Rights Institute, so I'm not, um, I was never someone who was using computers for, you know, engineering or math or anything like that. So I, I can't speak to what technology and computers can do in those fields. But um, but it, it is so much it's easier now. You have all this information at your fingertips. But is it you, but now it's the question of the validity of the information or how, is it can you corroborate that information or checking your sources and just being a critical consumer of information it's not that that wasn't important before but it's just become more important as the access to the information is just it's just sort of unprecedented in human history i used to show this um video to my kids it was called shift shift with a T happens. And it was just all of these facts about how much we're changing in this digital revolution. And there was one that like a week's worth of New York Times was more information than an average person would come across in their lifetime in the 1800s. And it's just like how many searches are on Google each day and like, I don't know, millions, billions. And like, how, who did you ask these questions before there was a Google? It's just 
it's hard to, I don't know, hard to see. I don't know if I'm just uncurious about as a middle schooler, high schooler, about what technology would be looking forward. But it was just sort of, I don't know that it satisfied a need because I had friends and we, you know, we communicated before there was instant messenger, (laughs) but um, it was just something that I adapted to. And then it just sort of became habit. You know, Mary, you were talking about, or and to answer Gary's question about, could we have foreseen any of this? And I'm thinking I'm constantly still surprised by the technology that is invented and the new things that come out. Um, I think it's really interesting to kind of also have like one foot in the beginning of this dot com era. And then (laughs) I have grown up to see, you know, like back when you tried and you you couldn't get on the phone if someone was using the Internet because dial up. That's. (laughs) Um, but to constantly see how this is changing and continues to change, I think since the invention of the internet, everyone is just trying to be a part of innovation and the invention. And like, it is this race for newer, better technology. And I think we're just going to, honestly, I don't really know if there's like a turning back point. I do think we have things like a nostalgia, perhaps, for old things like records, right? There's a new resurgence of love of collecting records now. Um, But I do think we're going to continue to have this this drive forward. And I'm still constantly amazed. I was sharing earlier the story about it seems so obvious to me how to work a laptop and a keyboard and a mouse. And I grew up being taught how to do that, whether like a, we had a technology class in elementary and middle school, go to the computer lab. Um, I, you know, in my years as a teacher, I taught young kids and we had some laptops in the classroom with mouses and screens and keyboards. And they would just sit there and tap the screen. They, their hands didn't know how to use a mouse. They never tried to type on the keyboard. They were just so used to the touch screen because that was all they have learned and been exposed to. Whereas I'm like, what? How? You don't know what this is? But obviously, right? Like it, it it's changing so quickly. And I think we'll continue to be surprised by um, what the future holds. Everything you're mentioning makes me think of how much this theme really, I mean, again, bringing it to how we think about in classrooms and really throughout history is there's a continuum, right? Unlike a lot of things, there's a continuum with these really interesting blips that are significant milestones in it. Um, But I think building on what we were just talking about, it's hard when you're in the middle of it to see. You you can see what has happened, and that's the the fun of doing history. But then the what is going to happen, I think, is you know the realm of kind of dreaming and inspiration. And along the way, this continuum is fascinating. When you were telling your story, Aaron, I was thinking similarly in my classroom. I went through a, uh, moving classrooms, and for some reason, I had acquired a lot of strange <laughs> machinery um, <laughs> that you know when and um, among them were a typewriter. And having to explain a typewriter to someone is a fascinating subject because on the one side, it makes sense. It fulfills that need. My handwriting is not nearly as good as a typewriter. Uh, Can I write physically faster than I can type? There's an interesting question. I bet a really good typist can type a lot faster than I could write, which then asks the question about, you know, what about how quickly you're thinking to get words out there? Is it faster with a typewriter? For some people it is than it is writing. That's interesting. But then there's also the how is it serving that need and to explain to a student, oh, well, you, you know, you press the buttons like you would on a, on a keyboard and then this little hammer goes up and it hits this piece of uh, fabric that has kind of ink on it. And, and, and they very logically were asking me like, well, doesn't it all kind of hit, like, doesn't it just make a jumble because all the hammers are hitting the same place? And it's like, oh, that would make sense, except there's another piece that is moving at a certain place to the left. And they're like, well, what happens when it hits the end? Oh, well, it makes a little dinging noise. And then you push it over. To me, it's very logical. <laughs> and yet to someone to whom it is unfamiliar, a technology like this, does it make sense? Um, in some ways, yeah, it's super cool. And it is better than my writing was. But at the same time, it is part of this continuum where it's going to get better. And it has, right? The way people create things is getting better. Um, again, than my handwriting uh, can be. But I think that brings up an interesting point that it's hard to tell when you're in the middle of it. My dad wrote his um, 
senior thesis in college on a typewriter and him explaining the process of how to get the final version of a thesis on a typewriter. I was like, that doesn't seem convenient at all. And God, how long did that take? You can't just backspace. And yeah, and um, he did. He went in and he would pull it out and you white it out, and put it back in, and you go over <laughs> and type over it again. No, and... again, for, for our listeners, white out, what does that mean? <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> I, that's another, I, <laughs> you paint over. Also, I remember, you know, it used to only be the paint white out and then you got the tape white out. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah so little, you didn't have teeny, to wait tiny for brush, it to dry. A little bit of quick, so yeah, you can just cover dry, up paint. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So basically <laughs> it was the same color as the paper for our young listeners who don't understand what white out is. <laughs> <laughs> So this is very meta. We're talking about ourselves trying not to be left in the dust, even though you're holding on to a technology that makes a lot of sense and you get really used to and gets the job done. If you hold on to it, you know, that's great in some ways. But are, are, are there are there downsides? I think I mean, I think that's there's up. There's always a downside. Um, so maybe we should take a quick break and we can consider the question of what do you lose when you gain something new like paper tape white out over the little brush white out so we'll be right back before break we were talking about this idea that technology and the change that accompanies a new technology is kind of a mixed bag. And a lot of it has to do with how you respond to that change. And there are, you know, there's lots of examples of changes big and small coming and, you know, different groups or different people having different reactions to them. But I think one of the the classic story is, of course, of the Luddites. And as a Luddite myself, <laughs> I appreciated learning the origins of the Luddites, the OG Luddites. Um, so, Gary, you are you are Mr. Textiles. <laughs> I, do love, I do love textiles. Yeah. I use them on a daily yeah. basis. <laughs> Perhaps you can. I mean, I think, but the Luddites are, are such a great example, though, of how people respond to a change. No, absolutely. I think it's part of what we've been talking about in terms of a continuum, right? This, it, When studying history, technology is not like it happened once and then there was a change. It is this continuous thing. There are, are, are rises and falls and, 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 and big leaps that happen. And yet w accompanying this continuum of technology developing are, as you were saying, and that was kind of your, your third big question, how do people respond to it? And like you said, there's, it's not all good or all bad. It's not all predictable. Uh, it's not all necessarily positive or negative. Um, but unsurprisingly, there's often going to be people who are um, – not not into this change that's happening. And and you use the phrase for yourself, but it's the idea of Luddites. And I think it's come to mean, you know, someone who doesn't want this new technology happening. Um, and it could be for various reasons. It could be just change in general uh, can be just real difficult. It could be something that threatens your livelihood. Um, I mean, you are right. I mean, the term does come from a group that did name itself. Um, it was a, a British at first, but really came to to mean people who, who were in the case of the British Luddites, who are actively like hammering and destroying machinery, um, but it's come to mean people who are at the lowest level, I would say, raising concerns and at the highest level, actively trying to halt this development of technology for various reasons. Um, I, I think that highlights that it is a very gray area, that there are often reasons to have uh, to to have pause when it comes to new technologies, but also reasons to say, you know, it's it, it's once it's out there, it's out there. It's like getting the toothpaste back in the tube, which, again, you know, before that technology, I don't know, you just have bags of toothpaste. I, I have no <laughs> idea. Um, but um, I, I think that raises another point and question coming from the Luddites, coming from those who said there were genuine concerns about their future of their livelihood and really the future of society. In their case, 
you know, taking some kind of violence against the machinery, but even today saying that, um, you know, this technology hurts more than it helps. Uh, we've used a couple of good examples, you know, from railroads to textiles to, to whiteout. But um, it makes me think of the, let's take the example of the technology of social media and those who have problems with it. Right. What are what are some of the. What are some of the problems people have? What are some of the, the reasons why people would, would not be in favor of the progress of social media? People actually feel more isolated now that social media exists than before it did. And I hear my friends talking all the time about so-and-so is doing this, so-and-so has this, so-and-so is doing that. And we're constantly comparing ourselves. I think we've always done that, right? But it's being done to such a greater extent because, you know, information technology, we have people's lives at our fingertips. And sometimes we hear about uh, big events through Instagram or uh, TikTok or whatever people use these days before that person were to tell us ourselves. And it also feels that that jealousy, that comparison game and feeling like you don't have enough or you are alone because no one is share, personally sharing that information and you only get it through like the secondary source. And I really think those play in with each other and it's really a balance of, you know, how can this still be a positive force and how can we still maintain real life communication with people? Like, that's my big thing. I still like talking on the phone. Yeah, right. You write a letter and suddenly you're getting the title Luddite, right? Oh, I, I, mean, grew, <laughs> I, I grew up being taught to always send handwritten thank you notes for things. That communication and connection with people, you know, we need to figure out a way to maintain that even as we push forward with all these new technologies. At the Luddite approach, you can't take a hammer to social media, right? You can't just bust in and stop the internet from happening with, with a tool. Mm -hmm. Nor is so that then, constructive. Right. So then people are left with, all right, what about removing myself then? If I can't stop this technology, if it's it's all out of Pandora's box, as they say, well, what if I remove myself? And there's certainly people who are like, well, I'm just going to take a break. I'm going to do a cleanse. I'm not going to be on social media anymore. But does that lead them full circle to help you start this of people who are going to be then, as Mary would say, left in the dust? Can you remove yourself from technology? Well, I think, I mean, I I personally think as someone who personally has <laughs> major qualms about social media, just, I mean, it, it's just a mixed bag. I mean, there's the privacy issue and then there's, especially for young people, because people are basically curating their lives online. They show you what they want you to see. So they're not going to take a picture of themselves, like eating a bag of M&Ms and sweatpants, thinking about what is the point of it all? <laughs> that kind of sounds nice to just filter. sit in my sweatpants and eat some M and M's. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that sounds great to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's um, but it's also it's an opportunity to keep in touch with with family and friends that you can't see in person, whether it's distance or whether there's you know a, extenuating circumstances like a, a pandemic or something like that. So it's really, I mean, I think it comes down to self-governance, which is what we are all about here at the Bill of Rights Institute and how you choose to conduct yourself. So it's, is it is it throwing out everything and saying, I'm not going to be a part of this? Or is it just using it judiciously or looking at information critically and saying, okay, there is the good and there is bad. I'm going to use it for good, or I'm going to try to think of a better way to do this. And I think that's, I think that's been a, an underlying thread of this conversation with the idea of technology and change is that it, it always, it brings good and it brings bad. It doesn't help everyone. It doesn't affect everyone in the same way, but that's the human way. I mean, again, I'm, I sound like, I'm very pro-human. <laughs> we are. We're problem solvers. We're adaptable. And there is going to – nothing is all good or all bad. It's. I think it's kind of silly and naive to think that anything would be that way. Everything is complex. There's lots of nuance when you talk about these things. But if you choose to look at it and sort of take from it what's useful and not disregard what isn't useful or what isn't helpful or what's only adding – to the problem, then I think we would be 
we would be in a good place. I want to highlight the uh, the irony of, um, but also the what you said about you know using things judiciously and invite people to say, yes, we are telling you this uh, via a digital podcast, and uh, we would love an email from you. <laughs> so, um, so the great irony is, um, we want you to reach out and we want you to uh, and ask us a question here or or even a comment at comments at fabricofhistory.org. So I think you're right. It is both good and bad. And we encourage people to uh, to communicate. Absolutely. I mean, we'd love to hear from you. And this, you know, this crazy moment we're living in right now, um, I think it's it's definitely changing things. But I do think that there will be some some good that will come out of it. So let us know your thoughts. Do you have a typewriter? <laughs> do you still have whiteout? <laughs> Can you connect us with someone who does? Hit us up. Comments at fabricofhistory.org. The Bill of Rights Institute engages, educates, and empowers individuals with a passion for the freedom and opportunity that exists in a free society. Check out our educational resources and programs on our website, mybri.org. Any questions or suggestions for future episodes? We'd love to hear from you. Just email us at comments at fabricofhistory.org. And don't forget to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to stay connected and informed about future episodes. Thank you for listening. 